So good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kunpanya Yu and I am with the United Nations Statistics Division. I will be moderating this webinar together with my colleague Yong Yi Min, uh, as well as with Alexander Loshki and Sean Lowell. So this webinar is jointly organized by the Global Network of Data Officers and Statisticians and the Intersecretariat Working Group on Household Surveys. The Global Network is a professional network of now over 3,000 statisticians, data officers, data scientists, and geospatial information experts. We use our online forum to uh, share best practices and to provide support to each other. And if you're not a member already, please join us at www.jammer.com forward slash. I will be sharing a link uh, to the global network later on in the chat. Before I go on to introduce the topic of the speakers, uh, let me invite Yong Yi to say a few words about the Intersecretariat Working Group on Household Surveys. Yong Yi. Uh, thank you, Panya, uh, for the introduction. And I would like to uh, thank the Global Network uh, for partner uh, um, bringing the webinar to everyone. And I thank you, our guest speakers from the uh, from UNHCR and the National Statistical Office. Just a few words about the Intersecretary Working Group on Household Survey. Uh, this uh, 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 was a, a group established by the UN Statistical Commission in 2015. Uh, with the uh, three mandates. The first one is improving survey coordination at the national, regional, and global level. And second one is uh, promoting an innovative approach on household surveys. And the, the third one is uh, communicating and advocating for great work on household survey from our members and the larger uh, survey community. So today uh, we we'll fulfill our mandate by offering a platform for exchange of innovative approaches and excellent work of our colleagues at UNHCR. So uh, the today uh, the topic of today's webinar is also very much in line with our commitment to produce data that are um, more disaggregated uh, for refugees and uh, uh, for uh, internally displaced uh, uh, persons. Um, so with that, uh, thank you back to you, uh, Penny. Thank you so much, Yongi. So today we are grateful to have three speakers from the Kurdistan Region Statistics Office, UNHCR and the expert group on refugees, IDPs and statelessness statistics or EGRIS Secretariat. Uh, they will be giving us a presentation on identifying refugees and IDPs in household surveys and EGRIS methodolo methodological paper. Uh, this webinar will discuss the various approaches to be integrated and implemented in future household surveys within existing household surveys programs and country specific household surveys. The speakers will explore both customization and integration of data elements proposed in the paper for major household programs, as well as the opportunities for technical support provided to national statistical offices by the expert group on refugees, IDPs and statelessness statistics on the integration of identification questions in standalone national surveys. Let me introduce our three speakers. Uh, Serwant Mohammed is the president of the Kurdistan Region Statistics Office since 2010. In his long career, he has participated in forming government NGO relationship and in establishing IDPs and returnees assistance strategies. He has also headed efforts to form emergency preparedness and response in the Kurdistan region. In his current role, Mr. Servant works to strengthen relationships and cooperations between the Kurdistan Region Statistics Office and Iraq's Central Statistics Office, as well as with international statistics offices and organizations. Uh, we also have Felix Schmieding, a senior statistician at the World Bank UNHCR Joint Data Center on forced displacement. Felix has held key roles in the development of international statistical standards under the auspices of the UN Statistical Commission, uh, including with the prior city group 
on governance statistics and the expert group on refugee, IDP, and statelessness statistics. Uh, last but not least, we have Felix Mitrick, uh, a senior technical, a technical advisor in the Secretariat of the Expert Group on Refugee, IDP, and Statelessness Statistics, or EGRIS, established by the UN Statistical Commission. As part of the Secretariat, uh, Philip provides technical support to NSOs on inclusion of statistical recommendations on refugees, IDPs, and stateless persons in data collection activities. His previous experience also includes establishing monitoring frameworks for INGOs, supporting people on the move along the Balkan migratory routes. Uh, so just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping reminders before we go into the presentation proper. Our three speakers will have 35 minutes or so to make the presentation, and we will have a Q&A session at the end of that presentation. Uh, throughout the presentation, please feel free to write your comments or questions at any time in the chat box. And during the Q&A session, uh, you are encouraged to unmute yourself and to turn on your camera and ask questions to our speakers. Once again, this is a global network webinar and it's being recorded and the recording will be shared on the platform later. We look forward to continued discussion uh, at the global network after this webinar. So with that, uh, let me turn the floor now to our speakers. Uh, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, so Compania and Yonggi for having us. Uh, thank you colleagues for joining us at the webinar today. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here. As you've heard, so Compania uh, mentioned, we have uh, three presenters for you today. We're delivering one integrated presentation. I will be starting off by uh, laying the setting the scene and, and giving you a, an idea of the big picture uh, backdrop for, for, this, uh, for this presentation. And then Sirwan will be uh, sharing a country experience. And then Philip will be uh, presenting a new technical offering, a new technical guidance that, uh, that has recently become available. So with that, uh, uh, if we could move to the next slide, Philip, uh, and the next one, please. The context here, uh, the big picture, if you like, is that forcibly displaced people, uh, so refugees and internally displaced people, are now standing at more than 100 million persons globally. And this is a huge increase in the very recent past. In fact, this number is more than double of what it used to be 10 years ago on a global scale. So it's really a, it's really a big, big issue. And it's, uh, and it's, a very, and it's really uh, an, in, an increasingly important issue. The vast majority of, of uh, forcibly displaced people are generously hosted in low and middle income countries. And not only is this, a, you know, is this a phenomenon that is is really uh, increasing very rapidly and has been increasing very rapidly over the last uh, over the last decade or so, but we also see the nature of it changing. We sh we see the share of protracted displacement being on the rise, and by protracted displacement we mean people who are staying uh, in the country of asylum uh, or in the country uh, in the host country. For, or staying in displacement, uh, in the case of IDPs, for not just shorter periods of time, but rather decades or even generations. And of course, if you have people staying in displacement for so long, then we can no longer speak only about a humanitarian challenge, but rather we can speak of a development challenge as much as it is a humanitarian concern. Next slide, please. Now, if it is a development challenge as much, much as it is a humanitarian concern, then of course, it only makes sense to treat it uh, with the same sort of uh, tools and instruments that we have to tackle development challenges. And that is why more and more we're, we're, we're hearing uh, and we're seeing that um, the inclusion of refugees and IDPs in government's development plans and development programs are absolutely essential in, in tackling the, the issue of forced displacement. So just to name a few, you have the leave no one behind principle of, of the SDGs and the agenda 2030, which obviously also include forcibly displaced people. 
You have the Global Compact on Refugees, you have the UN Action Agenda on Internal Displacement. And most recently in the lineup, you have the World Bank's World Development Report uh, from earlier this year, all of which are very clear in stating that you know, refugees and IDPs uh, should be included in, uh, in government's development plans and programs. But here comes, a, here comes a challenge because for government to include people or subpopulations uh, that live in the country into development plans and programs, government needs data and government needs data that it owns and that it trusts. And in the past, we've often had the data on refugees and IDPs produced primarily by humanitarian agencies. And if you looked at the, the big uh, national household surveys like the MIC or the DHS or the National Poverty and Living Condition Surveys uh, or the Labor Force Survey, the refugees and the IDPs were oftentimes excluded in these surveys that are led by national statistical offices. Next slide, please. But this is changing and it's changing very rapidly and very impressively, one might say. And there's, I would say, two strands of recent development that I would like to sort of point out. One is on the global level and one is at the country level. And the first one is that uh, at an international level, we've had uh, the UN Statistical Commission in 2016 establish EGRIS, which is uh, an expert group for, uh, for statistical standard setting on IDP and refugee and statelessness statistics which currently hold, has 55 governments among its members, 35 regional and international organizations. And it's been very active, right? It's produced three sets of international recommendations, one on refugee statistics, one on IDP statistics, one on statelessness statistics, all three of which have been endorsed over the course of the last few years by the Stats Commission. And as much as this is important uh, sort of in its own right, because uh, you know these three sets of recommendations are, are very, um, useful tools for, for national statistical offices to use. Um, it's also, if you look at it, if you zoom out and you take a bigger picture view on it, it's also a kind of reflection that the international statistical community acknowledges the need for national statistical offices to take a more active role in the space of refugee and IDP statistics and status and statistics. Because the UN Stats Commission doesn't establish expert groups and, and, and create and endorse new statistical recommendations if it's not something where the Stats Commission, which is a gathering of the chief statisticians of countries, uh, where they where the Stats Commission doesn't believe that there is a role to play and an important role to play for national statistical offices. So we like to see these dynamics around EGRIS and the three recommendations as a reflection of the bigger picture, which is that the new normal, if you like, is that governments take ownership of forced displacement statistics. Next slide, please. So that's the recent development at the global level, at the international level, but there's also very, very much momentum at the country level, which is that we're seeing an increasing number of national statistical offices include refugees and IDPs in their national surveys. So if we're looking at mix, then we're having, you know, we're having examples from, from Georgia and Lebanon. If we're looking at national poverty surveys or living condition surveys uh, or household budget surveys, household income and expenditure surveys, we know that these come by different names in different countries. Um, we've had a few sort of trailblazers, if you like, uh, back in 2018 that were really the first set um, to, to do this in, uh, in about five years back. And since then, the numbers have really been going up. So we've seen Chad, Uganda, Central African Republic, um, Uganda again, uh, Peru, Honduras, Mali. We've had, you know, we have really exciting momentum over just the course of a very few years. So um, yeah, really a lot happening. Same on DHS, demographic and health surveys in Uganda, Malawi, same on national COVID surveys. We've seen NSOs more and more and really uh, at, a, at an impressive uh, pace over, over such a short time, take up this, uh, this agenda of including refugees and IDPs in their, in their national surveys. And of course, this data that is created through the national surveys is rich and valuable. Uh, as it is for any other subpopulation in the country, but it's really valuable for informing government responses to forced displacement. And by extension, of course, also to the partners of government. Um, so it's, yeah, it's really, it's really a, an important development. It's really an important country level uh, dynamic that we're seeing and which we're trying to push uh, and which, if I may sort of 
on a side note mention, it's also something where uh, the JDC, where I work, we're putting uh, we're putting funding, uh, we're making funding available to national statistical offices. We're making technical support that's, uh, available through Agris, through through JDC, through others. Um, but it's really something that we're trying to encourage and enable as much as we can. So if you're working for an NSO in a country where there's a major uh, refugee and IDP populations, then please, by all means, feel free to get in touch uh, after this after this webinar if you see an opportunity there. Next slide, please. So just to sort of wrap, sort of summarize what I've just said in a nice little video that can express much better than I can. <laughs> Uh, Philip will share this little video. It's just two minutes long. Hopefully we can all hear uh, the audio and see the video. How do governments allocate health and education services, social protection and livelihood support? Data from major national surveys like MIX, DHS, labor force surveys on poverty and living conditions surveys play a crucial role in identifying who needs what. These surveys represent almost everyone who lives in the country, but they often exclude refugees and internally displaced people. This is a blind spot in national data and a real obstacle for governments in finding solutions to forced displacement, which the Global Compact on Refugees, the UN Action Agenda on Internal Displacement, and the Agenda 2030's Leave No One Behind principle are all calling for. Why are refugees and IDPs excluded from national surveys? When forcibly displaced people live in camps, these locations are often crossed off the map when the survey sample is selected. When they live among the wider population, they are only occasionally picked up by the random sample selection process. But because they constitute only a small part of the population, they end up being a tiny fraction of the survey sample. This is not enough to produce any reliable I think we may have lost the audio there. Cyber analysis. The solution is to include refugees and IDPs fully in national surveys. Changing the tide, a growing number of countries are beginning to include refugees and IDPs in essential surveys. Together with national statistical offices and international partners, we are fixing the blind spot, ensuring that refugees and IDPs are no longer invisible in national surveys. We at the World Bank, UNHCR, Joint Data Center on Forced Displacement, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Philip. So, um, that uh, hopefully puts it even more nicely than I could ever express it. Express it. Uh, and I'll just finish on, before I hand over to Sirvan, uh, I'll just finish on one last slide that sort of moves us hopefully like a bridge from the big picture to the, to the more uh, focused view on what does it mean at a technical level to include refugees and IDPs in national surveys. Now that of course is, a, you know, we could talk for a long time <laughs> about this. But just to point a few to point a few things, of course, one important issue is sampling, where uh, we have very few countries in the world that have such a high uh, refugee or IDP to population ratio that the regular sampling protocol of a survey will uh, will pick up sufficiently large subsamples for for the forcibly displaced. So usually, some kind of oversampling will be required, and that's of course a, a technical issue in its own right. Then there is the issue of identification, which today's uh, webinar is really focusing in on, which is about how do we know who is a refugee and IDP in our survey sample? And oftentimes we will have, uh, or not oftentimes, but sometimes we will have sampling frames that are that are sort of complementary for a refugee or an IDP straight in that will, where we complement the wider population sample with a, with a, a, a sort of complementary sampling frame. And we assume that everyone in that frame must be a refugee or an IDP, but nevertheless, uh, EGRIS recommends that one should still uh, always identify refugees and IDP through the questionnaire, even if you already think you know from your sampling 
uh, who, who the forcibly displaced are. And we have now this wonderful new guidance that has just recently become available and that we'll hear more about at this uh, webinar. Of course, there's always sometimes the issue of language skills, in particular, if we're talking about refugees uh, and we're talking about potentially um, some language skills that are not readily available in the usual uh, data collection field force of, of national statistical offices. And so those, I would say, there are more technical uh, things that one needs to address, but these are perhaps the three most pertinent ones. As a side note, I think one frequent misperception that we often hear is that if you include refugees and IDPs in your national mix or DHS or labor force survey, you need to add these big additional modules on forced displacement onto your survey. And that's obviously difficult when it comes to these uh, well-established surveys like a mix or a DHS or a national living condition survey, which already have really good and really well-tested uh, survey questionnaires, but which are also already very long. So adding additional modules on is often not possible or difficult. And in our experience, that's a misperception because yes, sometimes you need to add some small questions on, um, just a handful of questions for identification, but you don't need to add big modules on for additional indicators uh, because the indicators that you're measuring through these major household surveys are already really, really good and really rich. And it is exactly the kind of indicators that also matter for refugees and IDPs. Um, and if you look at the, you know, at the recommendations from, from EGRIS, one of the things that EGRIS says is there's some indicators that really matter and are really important for refugees and IDPs. And those are all 12 SDG indicators. So it's the same indicators that we're already measuring for the rest of the population. So if you're in an NSO and you're hearing this and you think, oh, but if I want to do this, then I'm going to have to make my survey questionnaire even longer. Don't worry. Usually that's not uh, that's not the binding constraint. So with that, uh, I'll hand over to Sirwan and uh, and we're going to go into a lot more focus now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felix. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Sirwan and I uh, represent Kurdistan Region Statistics Office in Iraq. Uh, um, today I will uh, show to you what uh, the Kurdistan Region Statistics Office uh, has been doing in the uh, recent years in relation to collecting data and statistics on IDPs and refugees. Um, before I go to the uh, establishment of EGRIS and uh, KRSO participation in it and uh, joining the steering committee later on, I would like to say that even before the establishment of IGRIS and because of the situation in uh, Iraq and in Kurdistan region, which uh, represents uh, about 17 percent, the population of Kurdistan region represents about 17 percent of the population in Iraq. Um, we had uh, two major incidents that led to a big influx of IDPs and refugees uh, to Kurdistan region. One of them was the start of the war in Syria, which we bordered them, uh, Kurdistan region. And uh, in 2012, uh, around 300,000 refugees crossed the border of Iraq uh, with Syria and entered Kurdistan region, mainly to the governorate or the province that borders Syria. Later on uh, in 2014, uh, we had, as you probably most of you know, the start of the war against ISIS. Now, at that time, Kurdistan region was protected uh, more than the rest of Iraq and uh, people from the rest of Iraq uh, at that time in 2014, in over a period of two months, about 1.1 million Iraqi uh, citizens came to the uh, Kurdistan region. So overall, between 2012 and 2014, around 25 percent of the population increased in Kurdistan region. We, uh, the population in Kurdistan region is at that time was about 5.5 million. So the uh, arrival of 1.3 or 1.4 million increases the ratio of IDPs refugees to the population about 25 to 26. Uh, having that said, <clears throat> in 2017, Kurdistan Region Statistics Office uh, was invited to, to be a member in, in IGRIS. We, at that time, was uh, about uh, developing um, recommendations, technical recommendations on IDPs and refugees. And then later on, of course, after 2021, 
the citizens issue is also included in the egress uh, uh, work. And uh, since 2020, we have been a member, I have been a member with my colleague in KRSO in the steering committee. Um, we have contributed to the development of international recommendations on IDPs, mainly because we in Iraq uh, are facing issues with, with the IDPs, and I will come to that later in, in another slide. And also we supported discussions on international recommendations on refugee statistics. Um, we also advocated for implementation of these recommendations in the region, and I here uh, need to say that um, Iraq uh, is a federal state, so there are two national statistics offices. One of them is the federal statistics office in Baghdad and the one in Kurdistan region that we need to work together uh, and uh, to um, include uh, the IDPs and refugees in our regional uh, data collection and surveys. And of course, when we conduct uh, joint surveys. Next slide, please. Uh, basically, we are responsible for collecting and managing official statistics in Kurdistan region, as you can imagine, with Iraq Central Statistics Office CSO collaborating in generating statistics for Iraq. <clears throat> and I have mentioned that uh, we have been hosting IDPs and refugees in Kurdistan region for the last almost 10 years. Now, uh, the number of IDPs now is less than uh, 700,000 uh, individuals. However, the number of refugees still remain between 250,000 to 255 and 60, depending on the situation in neighboring countries. Um, by participating in EGRIS, we have uh, raised the visibility of our work and we have brought uh, the technical expertise and we gained technical expertise and shared uh, opportunities with others to exchange ideas and uh, expertise, as we mentioned. Now, of course, the challenges we face, uh, you may find it uh, difficult for a country in the Middle East not to have beside Lebanon, of course, that we don't have a <clears throat> household census since uh, 1987. Now, that's uh, 33 years uh, we don't have a census. So you can imagine the last sampling frame for surveys is old from 2009, which was the last year, the last attempt to conduct a survey, which was um, um, a failure, um, um, uh, unfortunately, because of political reasons. Uh, another challenge that we faced uh, during our work is the multiple frames for IDPs and refugees. Uh, we have a, a frame that we developed our own. Uh, others have like uh, the Ministry of Migration and Displacement, another frame. So we had to work with different frames to be able to generate data and collect statistics. Uh, one of the things that also Felix mentioned, uh, at the beginning there was no real interest on knowing the status of IDPs and refugees in the Kurdistan region. Why? Because most of the IDPs and refugees are in Kurdistan region rather than the rest of Iraq. And for political reasons, uh, we couldn't um, draw the attention of the Iraqi government to be able to assist in collecting data. So we had to go by our own and start to work, and that's why uh, our our uh, participation in IGRIS uh, was very uh, beneficial to us, uh, if I may. Um, in the uh, Iraqi context, in Kurdistan region context, uh, most of the IDPs and refugees are outside the camp. So about 85% of the IDPs and refugees are within the host community. Some have been uh, there for the last 10, 11, 12 years. So, um, Collecting data on IDPs and refugees in the camps are, of course, easier. Now, finding them through a sample, uh, through a frame and a sample, uh, drawing sample from for surveys is always a challenge, and I will go to that point uh, later on. Um, administrative data nearly doesn't exist, that a reliable one that we can use uh, to generate a, a frame or to use for uh, generating statistics. Now I come to the uh, uh, experience that we have had. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that before, even before the establishment of IGRIS, we have been working on collecting data and statistics on IDPs and refugees. I would like to mention a few uh, examples. One of them was the, um, the big uh, comprehensive survey that we conducted in 2015. 
uh, to collect data on IDPs arrived uh, in big numbers to Kurdistan region in 2014 and in, by the mid of 2015 because of the war against Daesh, uh, ISIS. And then uh, later on in 2016, we conducted the food security uh, survey for the population in Kurdistan region with the help of WFP and we included uh, uh, a sample for uh, for IDPs uh, mainly at that survey. In 2017, we conducted a demographic, demographic survey because we don't have a census as I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, we conducted a demographic survey and again we included IDPs through the sample size that we have drawn and of course uh, the number of IDPs they were uh, representing uh, a province and not a smaller administrative unit because of the sample size. Uh, later on in 2018, uh, we had a, a rapid survey for a well-being of households and again we included IDPs in that one. So as you can see, we have been including IDPs and refugees in most of the household surveys that we have been conducting, of course, with deficiencies that uh, mainly goes back to the uh, sample uh, frame that we have. Um, another thing that we have been doing uh, since 2017 is uh, periodically we assist WFP in uh, monitoring the food security for IDPs and refugees uh, through our, uh, surveys that we are conducting uh, twice uh, biannually or three times each year. Now the recent one we have conducted was two months ago. Now we are working on Uni with UNICEF on, on developing a questionnaire for the next mix, which we hope to implement uh, early next year. And uh, we participated in a workshop uh, last May uh, to be able to discuss uh, how we can include IDPs and refugees in the next mix survey in Kurdistan region and Iraq, of course. And uh, again, uh, we are also uh, at this time um, trying to include the IDPs and refugees in the uh, next LFS, uh, which we hope to conduct also next year. One thing that I uh, forgot to mention is that we have already started working on a survey, which is a big one that lasts for one year. It's called the Iraqi House of Socioeconomic Survey. It's like DHS, but with another name. And IDPs and refugees are uh, will be captured uh, through that because the sample size allow for capturing them. As I mentioned, 85, more than 85% of the IDPs and refugees are uh, embedded within the uh, host community. Uh, I think that was, yeah. So uh, the, these are uh, just a, a snapshot on the questionnaire that we have developed uh, for the Iraqi House of Socioeconomic Survey. I will not go through them because the, these questions were developed in coordination with the World Bank and of course, we have shared these questionnaires, the questionnaire with the IGRIS team so that they give advice technically on the things that we think we've missed or we need to add, which they did, thankfully. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, okay. Sirwan. Um, uh, so um, I uh, I thank you. Thank you, Felix and Sirwan. Uh, my uh, part of the presentation will be mostly focusing on the results of the methodological paper. Before that, Felix has mentioned that EGRIS has developed three sets of recommendations um, and two of them, which are the IRS and IRIS, are the ones that are uh, reflected in this paper as well. Our statelessness recommendations have been developed uh, after the paper has already been drafted. Um, so they, we don't have identification questions for uh, stateless uh, populations, uh, but um, based on these two frameworks that include legal frameworks, but also talk about statistical framework that is further elaborated in the paper itself. Um, frameworks give a broad overview uh, in terms of uh, coordination, um, uh, advantages, disadvantages of diff different data sources and indicators that should be collected or are recommended to be collected for uh, refugee and IDP populations. Um, so this is the basis uh, for uh, any other methodological work uh, for uh, EGRIS and one of that is, is this paper. But uh, also, I just want to highlight that uh, based on our uh, mandate, EGRIS has revised a document called Compiler's Manual, which is more practical 
uh, ready to use uh, version of of uh, guidance um, that is that relies on recommendations and is divided in different use cases. Uh, so those use cases uh, talk about um, how 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 refugees or uh, IDPs can be included in the. Um, um, censuses, but for example, use case B and C are about household surveys and how uh, refugees or IDPs are included in, in household surveys. So issues that have been highlighted throughout these presentations, like issues of sampling, training um, and different modifications that would be useful in this setting are, uh, are a part of this document and any future methodological work like this paper will be included in future iterations of this living document. So. Just to give you a broader overview in which uh, setting the paper itself uh, was developed. Um, and it has been done, as uh, Felix has mentioned, there are uh, over 55 uh, members from country national statistical offices or national statistical systems and over 35 members that are uh, from international organizations in the EGRIS membership. But uh, how uh, next to the secretariat, um, EGRIS uh, also has uh, different technical sub uh, working groups and one of them is methodological uh, subgroup that has uh, uh, taken on itself to develop a different methodological work and one of them is this paper. As I mentioned, the international recommendations provide a broad uh, framework, but they have not identified potential questions that should be or could be used in household surveys. And the idea behind the paper that we are trying to highlight today is to uh, to actually bridge that gap and, and, and provide some insight on how these questions could be uh, used. So, um, as I said, there are two frameworks. IRIS is the framework for internally displaced uh, populations, and uh, in its statistical component, it defines uh, the categories that uh, are on this slide. So we have IDPs who remain in location of displacement, IDPs who return to their habitual residence, uh, IDD, IDPs who have settled elsewhere in the country, we have IDP related populations and other non displaced family members, and also uh, persons who have overcome displacement related vulnerabilities. The reason why I'm highlighting um, all these categories from IRIS is that this has uh, been a basis on defining the questions in the household surveys uh, to, um, to, to be used and to identify, identify populations. So in the proposed paper, the categories from IRIS that um, are highlighted in green, uh, we have identifications questions for them. There are additional questions needed that are usually found in the surveys for the categories from IRIS that are uh, highlighted in um, yellow, and there is future work needed to be established for categories that are highlighted in red. Um, so uh, we have defined questions, but the idea is to define data elements that are needed for each of these populations uh, to, um, uh, to be identified in a household survey. So there are two uh, key important elements for identification of uh, IDPs. One is uh, where, where uh, the respondent uh, forced to flee and then also their migration history in order to determine in which uh, uh, subcategory of uh, IDP population based on IRIS they would belong. And um, I here have uh, a, a set of questions that have been published in this paper. Um, next to the questions that we propose, um, there is also metadata in the paper that shows how um, theoretically these populations would be or different categories would be further uh, desegregated and calculated. But the most important part uh, is uh, um, whether or not a person was forced to flee. Forced to flee is a key element, and this is a, uh, this is there are five reasons that have been defined for uh, being forced to flee, and that means that they cannot return home for reasons independent of their will or, or, or control. So that can be a security reason, fear of persecution, human rights violation, natural or man-made disaster, and eviction. Uh, and then uh, based on the mig migration history, uh, we would be able to determine whether or not this um, uh, person has moved to any of the three categories uh, that um, um, have been defined in the uh, IRIS. Uh, if you look at the questions, we'll also see that there are 
for for people who are internally displaced, there are, there are questions whether or not they have uh, crossed an international border. And the reason for that is because although both um, persons who are in the IDP category and the refugee category are forced to flee in order to be able to um, force, forcibly displaced population, in order to be able to distinguish between those two, we would have to uh, have this information as well. So there are different scenarios uh, for uh, IDP status. Um, first of all, if a person was forced to flee but has not uh, crossed an international border, they're just considered an IDP. And then there are a bit more complications in terms of crossing an international border. So if a person has crossed an international border, border was forced to flee, um, but um, has stayed for over a year, uh, they would not be considered uh, an IDP person once they're back in the country uh, of enumeration. And also, if a person has been forced to flee, has uh, crossed the international border, has stayed less than 12 months, but um, has applied for international protection, they would not anymore, once they're back in the country, they would not anymore be uh, considered under the IDP framework, they would be considered under the uh, IRS framework or the framework for refugees, because then they would be returning, personally returning from uh, seeking international protection. So the, this, this, this component of identifying uh, IDPs has six questions. And uh, the reason why there is a question on, uh, on crossing the international border is to be able to uh, distinguish between categories uh, in the IDP uh, statistical framework and the next statistical framework, which is about the refugees. So, as I said, the second uh, set of recommendations that is covered by this paper is IRS. These are International Recommendation on Refugee Statistics. And as you can see, there are uh, quite, a, uh, quite a number of categories uh, statistically defined in, in this framework uh, next to uh, other elements that I briefly uh, mentioned. And all these documents are publicly available and, and uh, uh, anybody interested uh, can, uh, can um, uh, read through uh, more on, on the overall recommendation framework. Uh, so, uh, statistically speaking, uh, there, uh, there are people who are persons who are in need of international protection. That's in the first column of this chart. And they include prospective asylum seekers, asylum seekers, persons with determined protection status. And those are mainly refugees, but also people who are admitted for complementary and subsidiary forms of protection or admitted for temporary protection uh, in the country of refuge. And then there are others in refugee-like situations. Uh, next to this category, there, there are persons with a refugee background, which would be a naturalized former refugee, a child born of refugee parents, a refugee um, re reunified uh, family member uh, from abroad, and others with a refugee background. And a third category in IRS are uh, persons returned from abroad after seeking international protection. So those include repatriating refugees, uh, repatriating asylum seekers, returning from international protection abroad, uh, or uh, others returning from seeking international protection abroad. So in the document that uh, is uh, this uh, in, uh, this uh, methodological paper, uh, questions... Sorry about that. Um, so it would be uh, it would be able to um, identify people who are highlighted in green. So these categories, and for the categories that are highlighted in yellow, we would need uh, additional questions that are usually found in a household survey. And for uh, groups that are identified in red, uh, there is additional methodological work needed. But as you can see. Uh, more than 80% of the uh, framework would be, uh, we would be able to segregate based on the proposed uh, questions. So again, uh, here um, we have uh, key uh, data elements uh, next to migration history and uh, uh, being forced to flee. Uh, one very important element for refugee status is citizenship and uh, legal status. So um, these are the questions. There are nine, well, there are 10 technically questions that are needed to 
uh, identify the categories that have been mentioned in the uh, previous um, slide on IRS. And uh, to, to do that, um, we would be able to uh, identify most of these categories. Um, and I will just briefly also talk about how, um, what some additional methodological um, issues that we have discussed in this paper. So first of all, um, what are the modes of um, re response? We, we have discussed that probably the this question this set of questionnaires or these data elements would be most useful added to um, a proxy respondent somebody who is responding in the name of the uh, household or they can be also added to uh, individual questionnaires um, and uh, added to migration history questions um, also i just uh, wanted to highlight some of the um, issues that we have uh, discussed in the in the paper uh, first of all, um, would there be an issue if, uh, in, in terms of uh, proxy or, or direct respondents? And uh, we also are aware, of course, that uh, major household programs, and I think Felix has uh, highlighted most of them, already have migration questions. And the issue is that those migration questions are very well established. And in order to include um, these populations or identification questions, for uh, refugees and IDPs, um, there would be uh, some um, modification needed or trade-off because uh, we currently just use one question uh, to determine whether or not person has moved, but because of the migration history questions that are uh, used uh, in major household survey programs, those require for each migration history move at least two questions. And in that sense, there is a trade-off in a number of questions that would be necessary or the number of uh, different statistical um, categories that are defined by IRS and IRIS, that will be able to be included in a survey, which will again depend on the context and the sample in which survey um, has been done. Uh, so we feel that the future methodological work will require on one side refinement and testing use of these questionnaires, but also further uh, development and work in terms of integration of questions in standard household survey programs that already have migration modules um, and uh, linking them up uh, with existing questions and also deciding which categories are relevant for a particular uh, context in which a representative survey has been uh, conducted. So with that, um, and these recommendations, um, I think um, we can conclude uh, the, the, this part of the presentation and uh, I think we are opening the floor for uh, any questions from the participants. Thank you so much to our three speakers and a very comprehensive presentation on a very important pertinent topic. Uh, yes, indeed, we're going to open the floor for q and I have now enabled uh, camera and microphones. A few requests for those of you who would like to ask questions, uh, please identify yourself, your name, uh, where you're working and so on and so forth. Secondly, if at all possible, please limit yourself to one question. Uh, and third, please direct your question to the speakers. If your question is specific to one of them or two of them or all of them, please, please do direct them to, to the right uh, speakers. Uh, I have two hands, so I'm going to take two questions at once and then we can go to the speakers. Uh, first, I'll go to Stephen and then uh, Diego after. Yeah. Okay. Am I audible? We hear you, Stephen. Go ahead with your question. Okay, okay. My question is in to Mr. Mitrovic concerning the issue of uh, refugees. I would like to know quite a few things. Uh, RDP, that is eternally displayed, uh, an eternally displayed person, can they be classified as refugee? And also, I would like to know if anyone would leave their country over to another country. 
they are also classified as refugee. It's still just everybody that leave their country to another country, maybe fools food, maybe one or two, one of those means that he talk about maybe evasion or maybe war or whatever to another country. Can you classify just everybody in that particular range as a refugee? So it's two things I want to know what a, what a internally displayed person is a refugee and just everyone will leave their country over to another country to one of those means you talk about they are also classified refugee. So I want to know the particular term and condition on which a person is a refugee. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Can I take one more question from Diego before we go to the speakers? Diego, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'm Diego Eteraldi. I'm from Statistics South Africa. Um, I had posted one question on the on the chat, which was about identifying the legal status of um, either IDPs or um, uh, refugees. Uh, I I did indicate that I, I understand it's beyond the scope of this webinar to be speaking about irregular migrants, um, but uh, I just I just wanted to put that out there if, if if there is any guidance in terms of identifying irregularity through this this tool. However, the question I wanted to ask um, there was one slide that um, Philip showed uh, from one of the questionnaires, uh, one of the the um, uh, example questionnaires, where it asked about the different types of permits that were used when an IDP crossed an international border. My question is, uh, is there is there an onus on the respondent to show proof of that permit that they claim to have? And if there is an onus to provide the proof, um, Will that not detract from the quality of the responses? Because a person would want to show that that they do have the permit that they they claim to, um, but would not want to maybe show the document because they don't want to feel that the state is um, f following up on them and trying to check that they are not just somebody who crossed a border irregularly. And that that might result in in uh, a poor response rate. Um, so I, I I just wanted to ask about that trade off between uh, asking asking for this type of information and providing the evidence to show that they are evidently in possession of that type of of uh, permit. Thank you. All right, um, Philip. Seems like these questions are for you. So please go ahead. Thank you. So uh, first of all, in, in terms of uh, the crossing a border and being an IDP person, I think uh, just to, to clarify, this is a situation in which even if you cross a border and come back and you are enumerated in the country where you have return, you still might be an IDP. Uh, that's kind of uh, what, uh, who, who else will be an IDP? So if you cross a border, uh, you you were forced to flee. So one of these reasons that you were forced to flee, you have crossed the border and came back in, let's say, nine months, but have not requested uh, international protection while being abroad, you are still considered an IDP. That's what we are trying to say uh, with this distinction. distinction. Uh, if you have crossed the border and came back to, let's say, I'm, I'm, I'm living right now in Denmark. If I have crossed the border and came back to Denmark, but I have stayed for over a year abroad, maybe in Sweden, I wouldn't be able to be considered an IDP if I have been forced to flee initially because then I'm a long term uh, migrant. If I have crossed the border, stayed less than a year, but have applied for international protection, maybe I applied for asylum and my asylum was denied or I was I applied for the asylum. I, I was granted an asylum by, and I, I so I have a, a protection status, but I'm back in my country. I'm still not an IDP anymore. So it's just in a terms of being able to distinguish and not double count between these two um, statistical frameworks. Uh, so in any other in any other case, in most cases, inter internally displaced persons would not cross the border. But what we are saying is that if uh, you are in this, like maybe if this one scenario that has happened, you have stayed abroad for less than a year and have not applied for international protection, are back in the country uh, in which you're a citizen of, but were forced to flee uh, initially, 
it would still be considered uh, internally displaced uh, person. So that would be kind of my just like it's just an addition to what we commonly think of an uh, internally displaced, which means staying within uh, being forced to flee, but staying within uh, the borders of your own country. So there, there, there's this this additional people would also be considered. That's that's the only that's the only addition there. And uh, yeah, so uh, other thing in terms of the legal status, um, we have discussed uh, again. Uh, well, I just want to state that uh, these questions again need to be customized and used uh, for a specific context in which survey is happening. So, if there is a reason that a person might uh, that 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 is a refugee or has a protected status might not be willing to show doc uh, a document uh, for the questions that are related to IRS. Um, then uh, this needs to be considered before the, the, the question questions are deployed. We have had discussions with UNHCR registration uh, officers in general talking about uh, the willingness of a protected person who has, let's say, a refugee status and has a UNHCR issued refugee card and their willingness to show that document. And the way that in most contexts, and we are talking like glo global perspective, uh, uh, these cards are used very broadly to access certain services. So if this is the case, in most contexts, we feel looking or observing a legal document or a document issued by you know a national or or uh, national body or if UNHCR is involved in in the registration process is something that a refugee uh, or a protected person uh, um, under international protection uh, comes about often and is not something that is a sensitive topic but in in context where this might be the case uh, then then the customization and the use of certain questions has to be considered so we feel that in every um, particular context where, where where these questions might be used, a legal national legal context, a stock of uh, population that is forcibly displaced needs to be observed, and then based on that, decisions need to be made on how uh, questions are in included. Uh, uh, determining whether a person is an asylum seeker, a prospective asylum seeker, or refugee, those three categories can be done without observing a legal document, but for some of these other additional categories, based on the proposed bare minimum number of questions that we have tried to develop, uh, uh, observance of a document is also needed. But I don't know if Felix, you you may feel to to add anything on this. I think it's the question that Diego raised is a very valid one, and there's two sides of that of that question. One is the question, can you ask someone who is a refugee and has legal status to provide proof of that status? Does that affect the response rate? Does that introduce any kind of bias? And there's the other side is what about the people who are not, who don't have that legal status? And you're asking them, you know, what are you on the basis of which legal status are you actually staying here? And I think on both sides, uh, you need to make a, a sort of context based assessment and, and, and sort of decide whether in your national context are, you know, will you introduce potential bias or, or bring down response rates and, uh, for those who have the legal status if you ask them to provide proof and also for those who don't have the legal status. Um, whether whether that's appropriate, yeah. So I think there's no you know there's no one size fits all. Um, but the sort of from a methodological point of view, I think the what Phil has presented is sort of the best possible option. And then we need to see on the base of legal context how far we can follow that and how far we can deviate. Thank you. Thank you, Philip and, and Felix, and thank you also to Servan for answering some of the questions in the chat. Uh, please do put your hands up. Uh, I can take maybe another one or two questions. Uh, please do use the raise hands function if you have any questions for our speakers. I don't see any, so maybe I ask a question that was submitted in the registration form, and this is uh, about capacity building and about support for national statistical offices. Felix, I think you did mention uh, how JDC and Egress may be able to kind of work with NSOs who are interested in incorporating some of these questions. Could you give us a little bit more uh, information about what form of support you can provide and what can people do if they are interested in, in working with you guys? Sure, gladly. Um, indeed, so as I said before, when you're, uh, when you're thinking about including refugees or IDPs in your national survey, of course, 
you know, that doesn't come for free. Uh, usually you will add a sampling straighten uh, to your survey. With, so that's an additional uh, cost factor. And also you're, you're sometimes going into uh, uh, an undertaking that on the technical side, especially on the area of, of sampling, um, might pose challenges that are different from um, from the sampling you apply in the rest of the country. So on the funding side, you know, JDC has funding available uh, that um, that NSOs can uh, that NSOs can access. You can either you know reach out to me directly. You can also get in touch with your your UNHCR or World Bank uh, operations and, and country teams in your respective countries, and you know have a conversation with them about uh, getting in touch with the JDC. Whatever works best. Um, we always work very closely because JDC is a, a cooperation between the World Bank and UNHCR. We work very closely with and through the country teams of, of the World Bank and UNHCR. Um, so yeah, we, we have made funding available in, in a number of countries uh, where, where um, refugees and IDPs have been included in the national uh, household surveys. Uh, and then there's also the technical side, as I said before, you know, there's questions about how do you best identify uh, refugees on the questionnaire? And, you know, Philip has given a fantastic example of, of the sort of the wealth of technical support that is available through EGRIS uh, and through through JDC and others. And um, that's on, on questionnaire design. When it comes to sampling, you know, Sometimes there's a, you know, the, the, the sort of the classical scenario when you talk about a, an area based frame in your national household survey that's so far completely excluded, let's say the refugee camps. Um, then there is, you know, we can, we can help make the connections with uh, the relevant sampling frames, whether it's an area frame or a list frame from, from registration, administrative registers. Um, we can help make those links with the, with the right people in UNHCR, but also um if it's if you're you're not willing to complement your sample uh your sampling frame with a with another frame but rather you want to sort of stick with your standard frame and standard sampling approach that's also perfectly fine and perfectly understandable and then we can help sensitize that existing frame uh which usually means sort of stratifying your existing enumeration areas into the ones with high density or low density of refugees and then you can sort of you can oversample from the ones with higher density and uh, and and thereby get come to your refugee sample without having to use a sort of a, 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 an additional sampling approach, but rather you stick with your existing sampling approach and you just sensitize it if you like. So yeah, on the funding, on the on the questionnaire design, on the sampling, uh, in all of those areas, we're you know we're here to help. Where we have experience from a number of countries from different regions, uh, and hopefully there's a you know there's a good solution for for any NSO that's that's willing to. Um, become part of the pioneers in this uh, in this area. Over. That's great to hear. Thank you, Felix. Uh, we are already a couple of minutes over, but uh, I'll take one last question before we, we end. Uh, Roland, over to you for your question. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks everyone for the great presentation. Um, perhaps a, a question that goes a bit beyond what, what was shown and discussed today. I'm wondering about validation and in particular um, survey based estimates of refugee populations. Um, previously, uh, at, at another um, at ICBD in Vienna, I was running refugee service in Austria, and one of the questions we had was whether it would be possible to estimate the refugee population from those surveys because there was no officially living in Austria at the time given um, number of refugees, although the Minister of Interior had it. Um, do you, have you encountered situations or have you had use cases where you were trying to use the service to um, arrive at a population estimate and perhaps even uh, um, validating it or cross-checking it with official counts from uh, UNHCR, for example? I'm, I'm happy to take a first stab at that question. Um, it's one that often comes, uh, obviously. So I think what can be said about estimating the size of a population from from a sample survey is methodologically speaking is no different from refugees than it is for any other sort of subpopulation where you don't have a, a full sort of visibility on on the size of the population if you have a basically a survey sample is always just in, in terms of population estimates is always just as good as the frame that you're using right if you're using 
a very good frame, but it might be four or five years old, then as with any survey based on the census, you can update sort of, you can, your sample survey, if you do, a, you know, if you use the census enumeration areas, but you run a new listing uh, ahead of your survey, yes, you're going to sort of update uh, the representativeness that your survey has of the population. It will not reflect the population as it stood in your census five years ago, it will reflect the population as it stands now because you updated the listing in the enumeration areas that you sampled from. However, if you, and let me sort of stay in the example outside of the refuge, refugee space, if your census was missing part of the countries and your census enumeration areas at the first stage of your sample, uh, of your sampling approach missed parts of the country, then your updated listing for the sample survey will still be missing those areas that you're certain that your census missed because you you're going to miss them you're going to exclude them at the at the first stage and the same can be said i think in in analogy for for the refugees right if your sampling frame is is nationally representative in the first place even if it's outdated then you can sort of make you can update uh, on the basis of a sample survey but if your frame is compromised then you're not going to get a decent population estimate just from a sample survey now that's sort of spoken for traditional uh two-stage sampling methods right there are of course some innovative methods that sort of get you closer to a population estimate with an imperfect frame but whether those are sort of appropriate in the field of official statistics and whether those would be recommended for national statistical offices i'm not i'm less sure so yeah i think for if you're operating outside of the space of official stats then maybe there's something you can do but generally speaking your sample survey is not going to give you population estimates unless you already have a, a decent frame that you're merely seeking to sort of update um to the to the most current situation all right uh we are about six minutes over but i think that was a very useful conversation on behalf of the United uh, uh, Nations Statistics Division and the Global Network and in the Inter-Secretariat Working Group and Household Survey, let me once again uh, thank all three of our speakers for taking the time to speak to all of us today. Uh, and for all the participants, if I may ask you for a small favor, if possible, could you please unmute yourself and turn on your cameras to give our speakers a big round of applause for their presentation.